Thanks for watching Henry AI Labs. This video will cover dynamic programming, chapter four in an introduction to reinforcement learning by Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow. This video is a part of a series going through this book chapter by chapter, explaining some of the key concepts and ideas. A free PDF version of this book is linked in the description, as well as a print version if you want to buy it. Although chapter four is titled dynamic programming, the key takeaway is pictured here, generalized policy iteration. Compared to chapter three, where we use Bellman optimality equations to derive a system of equations to solve for the optimal value functions, the generalized policy iteration is a technique of iteratively approximating and getting closer and closer to the optimal value functions. And this is much more computationally tractable, especially when you have large state spaces. So we'll also talk about components of dynamic programming, like in-place dynamic programming to save you memory in your uh, value function state table, and then asynchronous dynamic programming where we update just a subset of the state space compared to doing an entire state space sweep of the value functions, which is totally impossible for things like backgammon with 10 to the 20 states or chess or many of these other uh, reinforcement learning problems we're interested in. Throughout the chapter, we'll motivate these examples with a concrete resource allocation example, imagining that we have a car rental business and we are making uh, decisions or actions to move cars between different locations and the number of cars at each uh, rental location represents the states of the environment. Before we get into the generalized policy iteration, let's quickly recap how we solve for the optimal state values in the uh, previous chapter, chapter three. So what we did in this uh, case is we used the Bellman optimality equations to look ahead to the future states and then use the reward that we achieve at the current state and then add it to the discount factor times the expectation of the next states that we can achieve. So from high we have the uh, option of either searching and receiving this reward for searching, and then we have the discount factor times the uh, value estimate of the next state, as well as if we wait and return to this state as well. So in this case, we're able to derive the system of equations, which we can solve relatively easily because we only have two states and a maximum of three actions at the low state. But when we have large state spaces, like in our car rental allocation problem or chess or backgammon, or many, many of these reinforcement learning problems, it's really not possible to solve this uh, system of equations explicitly. Generalized policy iteration is an iterative approximation algorithm, which is one of the most popular classes of algorithms in computer science and machine learning. So the way that this algorithm works is we randomly initialize our value function estimates of every state and start with a random policy. And then we proceed by evaluating the values of every state with respect to this random policy. And then we update our policy by making greedy action choices with respect to the value functions of this policy. So the way that the greedy action selection works is basically you just choose the action which takes you to the state that has the highest value estimate for that state. So overall, this generalized policy iteration algorithm loops itself until uh, it converges to the optimal value function and the optimal policy. And this leads to a sequence of policies and then value estimates with respect to that policy, such as this having a, an evaluation of the policy, then an improvement of the policy with respect to the value estimate, and then evaluate improvement until it converges to the optimal policy and value function. The generalized policy iteration algorithm is probably best understood with a concrete grid world example. So in this case, we have this grid world where we receive a minus one reward for every state except for these uh, gray shaded boxes, which is where we receive zero reward. So we initialize our policy to be making random up, right, down, left decisions all with the same probability. And then we initialize our value estimates by placing minus one everywhere, but zero on the terminal states. So already we have this value function here, and we can see here how we make the policy greedy with respect to the value function estimates. So see how in this state, we make the decision to move left because we're moving from this minus one state. We can either move to another minus one state, uh, this right is a minus one state, or we can go left, which is the zero state. So this is what it means to make the policy greedy with respect to the current uh, value estimates of the states. So now that we have this new policy where this state is, uh, is leading you into a zero reward, we can now estimate it with the Bellman equations, which leads this to being minus 1.7 rather than the minus two of its neighbors. And we repeat this until we reach the optimal policy and the optimal way of moving towards one of these shaded boxes, given whichever state you're currently in. Now that we've seen the grid world example, let's formally walk through the pseudocode of the generalized policy iteration algorithm. So we initially uh, initialize our value estimates of every state, and then we have some random policy. And then we loop through this uh, evaluating the policy and then improving the policy. So the way that we evaluate the policy is with our Bellman equation lookup where we have the MDP dynamics of the transition probabilities and the rewards. And then we use the discount factory times the estimate of the next state that we're leading to with the action that we're taking with and the policy, the policy uh, parameterized by S here is giving you the action that the policy is making you take is mapping you from this state to this action given uh, pi parameterized by s. 
So then what we do is we have this delta to stop our policy evaluation because we see here that there's an inner loop within our policy evaluation. So even in here, we're looping through the uh, v, v of S to make it converge to some uh, value function estimates of the states given our current uh, policy. So if this delta, meaning that the update to the value of each state isn't that large, then we decide that we've successfully evaluated the policy. And then we return now to improving the policy by making it greedy. And the way that we make it greedy is by using this argmax A, meaning that select the action which takes you to the S prime state that has the highest reward with respect to the value function estimates that were just made in step two. When we're improving the policy, we're selecting the action that is going to take us to the next state with the highest value estimate according to the value function estimate that we just did in step two of the generalized policy improvement algorithm. So this proof and this derivation is showing that if you update your policy to pi prime for this uh, current state, then it's going to be better than the original policy pi for all states because it is the same policy in every other way. And taking this greedy decision is always going to make it better and not worse. And this is an important property of the convergence of the GPI algorithm. Next, we'll motivate our dynamic programming and our generalized policy iteration in the context of assigning resources in the car rental problem. So the states in this example represent the number of cars at each of the locations, and the actions are these decisions to move cars from location A to location B. And then there's some random variables in the environment that determine things like whether the cars are returned to the location at the end of the rental, and then what the demand of the customers is for cars at each uh, say time interval like a day. So this progression shows how the policy is improving in the GPI. So in, originally the policy is just making random decisions, the zero denoting that it doesn't move cars from location to location at all. And then it starts to evaluate the values of, you know, which uh, distribution of cars at location A and location B you have. So you can see in the converged policy, in the case when you have uh, 20 cars in each location, this is optimal and you don't move any cars anywhere. But if you're in this case where you have uh, 20 cars in the first location and then zero at the second, you would move five from the first to the second, which, you know, would only make sense. So we see this uh, progression of the policy, and I think that's the most important thing to take away from visualizing this example is seeing how this iterative policy evaluation algorithm leads to this convergent policy on the resource allocation problem. So one of the interesting characteristics of this car rental problem compared to the recycling robot MDP that we've seen in the previous chapter is that we have a large state space. We can either have zero cars in A, zero cars in B, all the way up to 20 cars in A and 20 cars in B. And then we have this contour map depicting our uh, policy decisions, sort of like granularizing each of these steps is, uh, would be a very like tedious diagram. So rather we have this contour map that shows a similar policy for uh, different states. Another interesting detail of the car rental uh, MDP problem and the example that we're using for resource allocation is that we have a different method of stochastic transitions and rewards. So we saw in the recycling robot how we have the alpha and then one minus alpha and the beta, one minus beta of transitioning from state to state given a certain action. But in this case, not only do we have this stochastic transition, it's parameterized in a more complex way. So the way that the uh, returns of the cars and then the demand of like how many cars are rented from each location are given by these Poisson random variable distributions. So it's a little more complex than just having an alpha one minus alpha sort of probability distribution with respect to how the Markov decision process trans uh, transitions from state to state given a certain action. Additionally, we have a stochastic uh, reward variable now as well because the demand is a random variable that isn't going to be the same every single time in every single state. So this is just contrasting to our recycling robot in which the transitions are much more straightforward and the reward is uh, deterministic. We have the same reward for every action in this, in this uh, like toy problem to motivate MDPs and understand this framework. We'll conclude discussing the generalized policy iteration algorithm with a couple of interesting characteristics about it. The first thing is this interesting tug of war between the evaluation and improvement. Because every time we evaluate the policy and update our value functions, then it makes the policy no longer greedy. And then every time we make the policy greedy with respect to that value function, the value function estimate is no longer uh, correct. Another interesting characteristic is our policy evaluation loop. So there's an interesting distinction in the book between policy uh, iteration where we loop through several times until we hit this delta threshold and then exit out of the evaluation loop compared to something called value iteration where you only make one loop through this uh, value update despite uh, whether it is completely converged to the correct state uh, estimates. 
but the book uh, gives you some convergence guarantees for why value iteration will still work in the GPI framework. Now we'll transition our presentation of the chapter from the generalized policy iteration algorithm to some characteristics of dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is a technique in computer science frequently used for things like genetic sequence alignment or like spell checking. Basically what you're doing is you're bootstrapping the computation, computation by using your estimate of uh, v sub k plus one to uh, estimate the state function with v sub k. So the in-place dynamic programming basically refers to this idea of not using a separate array that holds the previous value function estimates at time step k. So what we would do rather is we update these state values in a single sweep with our Bellman equations. And this might cause a little bit of noise in the updates because, you know, obviously as you update this uh, state two, it's, it might have like a higher magnitude of updating state three. Like you can imagine with the grid world example, how you traverse the grid and then how you update the values of every state is totally dependent on the previous updates. Another interesting extension to dynamic programming that makes it applicable to, you know, interesting uh, reinforcement learning problems like chess and backgammon is this idea of asynchronous dynamic programming. So in backgammon, we have 10 to the 20 states. So the book motivates this problem by saying, if you were to do a complete state space sweep and update the value function estimates of all 10 to the 20 states, that would take 1000 years at a speed of 1 million state updates per second. So asynchronous programming, dynamic programming, refers to this idea of updating the value estimates of a subset of states rather than the entire set of states at every uh, policy evaluation uh, iteration. So asynchronous dynamic programming can also be distributed across machines. So we can imagine sending, say, uh, this top left half of the uh, states and the value estimates to machine one, this top right half or quarter to machine two, and then you know distributing state spaces in this way. And then you might have sort of a noisy value function update, but the book uh, gives a more concrete example for how this will converge. The chapter also presents another uh, example of generalized policy iteration. In this case, you are betting your, uh, your capital on a coin flip with a probability of P sub H equals 0 0.4. And then you're making this policy where you're deciding how much you wanna bet given each amount of capital. So in this top chart, you see how the uh, value estimate of the states are converging with respect to the iterative sweeps through the uh, GPI algorithm. And then you see sort of an interesting policy where if you're at 50, you bet all of your money. And if you're at like 51, you would just bet a little bit. See with the, um, the policy is the mapping from the capital state to the action being how much you bet on each coin flip. So it's an interesting little policy to see. And then this uh, chart here is interesting to see a visualization of the convergence of the GPI algorithm. Thanks for watching this explanation of dynamic programming, chapter four in the book, an introduction to reinforcing learning by Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow. Hopefully from this video, you took away the idea of generalized policy iteration and characteristics of dynamic programming like in-place memory tables and asynchronous updates. Please stay tuned for chapters five through 17 in this series on an introduction to reinforcement learning. And please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and artificial intelligence video.